We are on Chapter 8. It says more about Regent Exeter. I was on reporting restrictions with the UK Border Agency. In this chapter, I explain why the authorities would not let me stay with him. Then I narrate how his doctor is supposed to have written a strange alphanumeric code which was a secret between him and the village pharmacist so that Regent would receive a special preparation instead of his regular medication. The unknown medication looked very different from his usual flopenthixol. He was told IR was flopenthixol. This unknown preparation was making all his symptoms worse. His rapid deterioration soon led to his death, unexpected by friends and family. In the last part of Chapter 8, I narrate about two email series, of which the first email arrived on the eve of Regent's death. These emails appeared to make fun of Regent's burial and contained bizarre details about Regent and about my family members who don't know each other. One series was sent by a namesake of my niece, following which a young lady impersonating my niece called about those emails. These are the emails that I showed to an eminent lawyer narrated in Chapter 7. Immigration told me they did not mind if I went out of town for a few days. But I wasn't supposed to change my residence without asking them for permission. Because I was a foreign national, and Regent was on state benefits under disability, they would not allow him to keep me in his house. That way, he would be providing accommodation to another person with no benefits entitlement. Like if you were paying rent to your landlord, you would have to tell them that you are going to have another person in the house, and they would usually say okay. But with free accommodation, and with me being a foreign national of ambiguous immigration status, they had a right to decide against this. We didn't fight the refusal by the housing authority. So I stayed only for the weekend. Or for a couple of days. Between January and March 2014, my last two visits to Regent in Schiffnell, I used to keep in touch with him on the phone. Regent shared with me from January 2014 that Dr. B gave him a new tablet which made him feel a lot worse. Regent laughed and joked that the new pill was designed to get him a lot worse. I asked what was getting worse, and he answered, everything. Regent explained that when he saw his doctor once a month, the doctor wrote a prescription for the next 30 days which he, Regent would take to the village pharmacy to cash. Regent said over the phone that recently, on his monthly visit to Dr. B the GP had written some strange alphanumeric code on the prescription instead of his usual maintenance dosage of flu penthixol. Regent had asked Dr. B what he was writing and Dr. B had said, that is a secret code between me and the pharmacist that nobody else can understand. I would not have cashed that prescription if I was in his shoes. I would have called the health authorities. Perhaps not the police, who would have treated me with contempt, called me a mental patient and sent me away. Regent was already very far gone health-wise. He cashed the peculiar prescription and kept taking the tablets while saying amidst peals of laughter these tablets were designed to make him worse. I don't know if anyone would remember, and I'm not sure if it's still done. Your pharmacist can prepare your medicine. They can cut tablets and crush or mix them. Stuff like that. Dr. B said Regent was a madman and to disregard anything he said. I don't think he was I think he was quite intelligent and he helped to compile the Oxford Dictionary. I believe Regent but we do not have any proof that it happened because now the man is dead. Regent said when Dr. B wrote that strange alphanumeric code on the prescription, he received capsules of a different color and size than the one that he identified as flu pentaxel. I would assume if the doctor wrote an alphanumeric code, it must have a secret meaning to the pharmacist. So, it would make full sense to suspect that something else was being administered in secret. However, the fact that medicine issued under that alphanumeric code is a different color and size doesn't mean that it wasn't Regent's usual flu penthixel. Sometimes the same medicine can come in a different shape and size because it is made by a different company. But if we are to believe that Regent was a reliable witness, the different-looking medicine was issued on a coded request by Dr. B. And it was doing funny things to him, he felt worse and worse about it. I believe Regent was a reliable witness and a scrupled kind Christian man. The weakness in my argument is that I am myself a piece of rubbish. The weakness in drive. B's argument is that the person calling him an incoherent madman, 
and the person suspected of giving a 54-year-old euthanasia against his free will. It will take no skill at all to take the powder out of one medicinal capsule and put it into another. I'm sure many medicinal tablets that would not kill a normal person would kill someone with heart failure. The term heart failure was suppressed from Regent's posthumous medical record leaving no evidence he had it. Any GP would know what to give to improve or deteriorate your heart. Particularly as lethal doses of cardioactive substances can be smaller in size than a mustard seed, it is easy to administer these covertly to people who are slated for departure. I have heard other stories about the administering of cardioactive substances. Regent had charisma and could make crowds laugh. He had a huge complaint against the medical profession and a man-to-man -man grudge for years against Dr. B. The complaint would have become popular with the public. Having my support as a friend, I encouraged him to write, and Regent wrote one book. It is honestly so depressing to live in a world where nobody speaks to you. That is what happens to those who are not chosen by the Most High, the Home Office. Jungle folks will not believe such a thing is possible. But the home office is a man-made artifact with no natural components. Any laws of the jungle may not hold good here. So Dr. B may have realized with me as Regent's friend, it was a good time for the lonely man to die. Take me for example. Since July 2018, I have been on a drug every day which is called a beta blocker. This is for my heart failure. I am not allowed to take various drugs known as beta enhancers. I am not suggesting that if I take a beta enhancer I'll die immediately, but that might depend on the dosages and duration as well. I'm sure a doctor would have a variety of ways to kill a patient with diabetes heart failure or high blood pressure and anything they have by administering something that would not kill a normal person and maybe would only have a slightly bad effect. Regent may have also been put on a clinical trial of a highly risky drug. I was listening to a talk at the Institute of Physics in 2014 before I was banned from their building. They said that most clinical trials in the UK are done without the patient's consent. I assume that would be the case for all countries. The government ombudsman rejected my petition and they said except for the decision they gave, I was to keep all correspondence between me and the ombudsman's office secret. Failure to do so, and should I disclose any of this correspondence to the public, I would go to prison. She wrote that I may think correspondence between me and a government department was accessible by no one but me under the Data Protection Act it was not my property so I could not publicize it as I wished. As I see it, what would be achieved by restricting me from publicizing the correspondence while the final decision was public? I think there might have been stuff my the exchanged correspondence that could make members of the public feel the decision was not fair. That would make the starry-eyed and trusting public realize that some people in the UK are not protected from grief, unlawful death, and injustice. Regent died on March 26, 2014 I received special emails for about six months after Regent's death. The first email arrived on the previous evening to Regent's death. I estimated there were around 200 emails in all. These emails started to thin out and eventually stopped arriving in September 2014. The emails appeared to make fun of Regent's death, as I will explain shortly. This should mean the email senders knew about Regent's death. Since the first of these emails arrived on the eve of Regent's death, the sender of these emails knew that Regent's death was about to happen. People close to him had no idea on the eve of his death that he was going to die soon. These 200 or so emails I have saved as a PDF binder called BurialJokesBinder.pdf. I know that I am different from the rest of the human race. I am different from people blessed with intimacy privates, who are sex experts at woman help, and whom I shall refer to simply as intimacy privates. Intimacy privates are not interested in matters of a technical nature, and have fewer non-body thoughts. The sad truth is, in the UK and whereabouts, Anything that fails to interest intimacy privates becomes lost in history, and forgotten. This lost and forgotten list includes murders that will not be investigated. If intimacy privates are not keen on a murder investigation, the murder will be swept under the carpet. With all due respect to glorious, fantabulous, tantalizing intimacy privates, I shall continue my story.